This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in Berlin. These are the stories that set your agenda. Israel vows to retaliate after Iran fires about 200 ballistic missiles, saying Tehran made a big mistake. We will bring you the latest from the region. Traders flock to haven assets with gold holding near a record and oil moving higher. But Chinese shares listed in Hong Kong extend their blistering rally to a 13th consecutive day. We'll discuss Middle East tensions and the wider global outlook with our exclusive guests from the Berlin Global Dialogue, including the forum's founder, Lars Hendrik Droller, and Allianz CEO, Oliver Beta. Well, with geopolitics and the risk factors firmly in focus for these markets, European futures pointing to gains as we build towards the open 8 a.m. UK time, of course. The upside coming through after losses yesterday across European stocks of around 0.4%. You're looking to make up for that so far as futures point higher by four tenths of a percent. FTSE 100 futures in the UK looking to add 28 points, up three tenths of a percent. S&P futures currently pointed to losses of a tenth of a percent after U.S. stocks. The S&P fell close to 1% yesterday. Nasdaq taking a hit of 1.4% by the end of the close. Nasdaq futures looking to build on those losses, pointing lower by 38 points. Let's flip the board and look cross asset. The U.S. benchmark 10-year continues to be in focus. Those safe haven plays and the feature of gold. The U.S. 10-year at 373, euro dollar at 110, down a tenth of a percent. And Brent rallying again after jumping almost 5% in the session at one point yesterday. Currently at 74.68 on those Middle East tensions, up 1.5%. Gold holding above 2,600 but currently down three-tenths of a percent. Let's briefly check in on Asia. Mainland markets are closed in China, but the gains coming through once again pronounced the property. One of the property indexes gauged by Bloomberg soaring, in fact, 90% just over the last five days. The MSCI Asia Pacific up six-tenths of a percent. Yes, property stocks doing the heavy lifting along with securities and brokerages listed in Hong Kong. The Hang Seng Index then up 6.3%. The HS Tech Index soaring. More than 9%. The Nikkei over in Japan, though, dropping close to 2% in the session. Let's get to the Middle East right now, where Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to retaliate after Iran fired about 200 ballistic missiles at the country last night. The barrage started only hours after the US warned an attack was imminent. The Israeli army says many missiles have been intercepted, with reports one person was killed in the West Bank. Iran made a big mistake tonight, and it will pay for it. The regime in Iran does not understand our determination to defend ourselves and our determination to retaliate against our enemies. Let's get more from Bloomberg Horizons Middle East and Africa anchor Jamana Pesetchi. Jamana, what do we know about this salvo of missiles, ballistic missiles fired by Iran, the scope and scale of this attack? Yeah. Around 7.30 p.m. local time yesterday, uh, the Israeli military said that Iran had sent over around 200 ballistic missiles into Israel. Explosions were heard across central cities. Uh, now, the IDF said that most of those missiles were intercepted, uh, causing limited damage. But there are reports uh, that one person may have been killed uh, in the West Bank and, and potentially on back of shrapnel, uh, as opposed to being directly hit. Uh, but some of the missiles, uh, per Iranian state TV, uh, did actually appear to hit their targets. Uh, Iranian state TV is claiming that these strikes targeted important security and military sites. And of course, this is the response from Iran, a retaliation to the killing of some of their senior allies over the last couple of weeks, notably Hassan Nasrallah, leader of Hezbollah, Ismail Haniyeh, who was killed in Tehran about a month ago, and one of their senior IRGC commanders who was also killed in the same airstrike that took out Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, they have also said that another wave of strikes could come too, as uh, something to bear in mind, but that depends on how 
Israel themselves retaliates. Now, a couple things to note here, Tom. The first is that this is the second episode of direct attack from Iran to Israel. The first, if you remember, happened back in April. But a few distinctions that people are drawing on. The first, the, the first distinction is that the type of missiles used in yesterday's attack were ballistic missiles. They're faster moving and more potent. Back in April, they used slower moving missiles and drones, more easy to intercept. And the second point to note is that this time around, they also choreographed it less. The U.S. and Israel had less time to put up their defense system. But, uh, of course, by the time it did actually take place, they were able, um, Israel, with the aid of the U.S., to take down uh, most of the ballistic missiles that were sent towards the country. And so, at this point, uh, Israel is on a state of high alert. We have heard comments from the Israeli prime minister uh, saying that Iran has made a big mistake tonight and the regime will pay for it. So uh, the world is on high alert to see how Israel will likely respond to these barrage of missiles. Well, indeed, and that, of course, remains a key question, as you suggest. How close are we, Jemana? What is the assessment right now of how close we are to an all-out regional conflict? And that is the major question for the region, and certainly we're a lot closer than we were a couple of weeks ago because there are wars or conflicts, escalations being, being waged on several fronts here. Um, it's also notable that the same day that Iran launched these barrage of missiles at Israel was also the same day that Israel started a, uh, what they called a targeted drone incursion into Lebanon. Airstrikes in Lebanon have continued over the last 24 hours in southern parts of Beirut, across eastern Bekaa as well. And then also notably, uh, airstrikes uh, were, were targeted against some of these key spots in Hodeida and Yemen too. And so there are attacks taking place on all fronts here. I think it is important also to note uh, that just in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, Axios have reported uh, that Israel will be likely to respond in coming days and that they plan a significant retaliation to the Iran attack. And what they're saying here is that some Israeli officials are saying they could even target Iran's oil facilities. And the big question, of course, is not only whether they target the oil facilities, because that will be key uh, for, for global markets, but also potentially nuclear sites as well, which would take it to a whole other level. Okay. Bloomberg's Jumana Basechi in Dubai with the latest, of course, our Horizons anchor on the tensions in the Middle East and the escalation, significant as it has been that we have seen. To the oil markets there, and Jumana left it on that point, that potential uh, retaliation from Israel. Oil extending gains then as geopolitical tensions escalate. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Stephen Stavchinsky for the analysis. Uh, Stephen, Jumana uh, put that on the table. That's a potential option we are hearing, at least according to reporting, Israel could could target some of the oil infrastructure of Iran. What are oil traders monitoring right now as we see Brent up over 1% once again today? I mean, that's precisely it. Uh, is right now, um, over the last year, as this conflict has, has kind of rolled on, there have been um, some strikes, there have been retaliations on, on each country. Um, but Overall, oil has remained intact. The output of oil largely has not been affected. There have been some maybe off of Israel's offshore a gas field shut as a precautionary measure here and there. But the flow of oil to the rest of the world has not yet been affected. So is this actually going to happen? Is Israel really going to hit potential sites that could curb or hurt, um, affect Iran's uh, oil production, oil exports. Um, Iran produced over three, uh, produces over three million barrels a day of oil. That's about three percent of global supply. So any um, disruption there, you would see a sustained spike in oil. I think the traders are expecting that any sort of attack or any confirmation on attack on the infrastructure, we could see oil prices rise further and that war premium continue to balloon. Now, if that doesn't happen, and any retaliation uh, doesn't lead to any disruption to oil production, we're going to see Brent crude, which is now around $74, fall back towards that $70 range because it is still a bearish mood. There is worries about oil uh, demand in the United States and elsewhere, and production remains strong. 
Okay, excellent analysis as we continue to watch the fallout in terms of the oil market reaction as well. Brent up 1.8%, WTI up close to 2%. Bloomberg Stephen Stupchinsky, thank you. Stephen, let's keep our focus on the Middle East and the escalation that we have seen and bring in right now Neve McBurney, Associate Director for MENA at Specialist Risk Consultancy Control Risks. Neve, good morning. Thank you for joining us bright and early. What are the potential response scenarios being considered by Israel at this point, do you think? Good morning. Thank you for having me. So there's quite a wide range of potential responses. Um, uh, higher up on the likelihood list is going to be uh, in Lebanon, as, as Jamana said. There was already enhanced drone attacks last night. So we can expect that to continue and, and probably increase. Um, there is also the, the possibility being discussed of right the highest up the escalation ladder of uh, attacks by Israel on uh, Iran's nuclear and oil facilities. Uh, it's our position that that is um, effectively an outlier scenario, that that would only come in the severest possible escalation. The situation we're in right now is obviously concerning, but um, to some of the points that Jamana highlighted um, just a couple of minutes ago, you know, this was, if we can call it a measured response by Iran, it was a contained response to the attacks that, that Israel has carried out on I Iran's sovereign territory and its and its proxies. Um, so Iran conceives of it in that way. Yes, it used, um, you know, weaponry that it hasn't before, it's, its ballistic missiles, uh, but it targeted military sites, as far as we can tell from what the Israeli press are allowed to confirm uh, by the, the IDF. Um, so... There will be an Israeli response. Israel always looks to, to have the final word in this, as they did in, in April mm -hmm. when they targeted Isfahan in response to the previous uh, missile and rocket barrage. Um, it's probably going to be a notch up the escalation ladder. Uh, the question is now, is decision making within Israel, um, the relationship between Benjamin Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant, the, the defense minister, um, and how Israel perceives its position right now and what it would like to do in, in the next couple of months. Uh, we need yeah. to think slightly towards the longer term here as well. Neve, does, does Israel act alone or does it act in partnership with the U.S.? The U.S. will support it. Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways it does, including in providing military aid. An additional uh, tranche of that was signed off just a couple of days ago. Um, the, we ca we should not expect the U.S. to um, engage its military forces in support of Israel. So if we're talking in technical operational terms, it will be Israel acting alone, as it has done in the past. Um, and, and, you know, that's a role that it is uh, content to, to carry out. It sees itself as strong and robust enough, as it has shown, frankly, over the last couple of months. Neve, how dangerous is this moment, drawing on your deep expertise around this region? It's a very, very concerning moment. Um, because there is the potential for significant escalation. I would highlight to your viewers, though, that in the attack carried out last night, Iran has signaled in its own way that it is not looking to escalate. Um, it is Israel's perception of its incredible strength uh, at the moment, um, its ability, uh, the, the best opportunity it has effectively in 40 years to um, severely weaken, if not defeat the axis of resistance across the region, which it perceives as a, as a, as a strategic and fundamental threat to its security. Um, but but in the context of a regional history, we're in a deeply, deeply concerning moment. Uh, we can draw parallels with, with 1967 um, in terms of the um, kind of strategic uh, issues at play and the potential for, um, shall we say, not literal maps to be withdrawn, but certainly um, kind mm -hmm. of uh, how countries perceive of their own strategic position and what they would like to do over the next 10 to 15 years. It's absolutely fundamental. Okay. We are living in history right now. Well, uh, on, on the potential redrawing of, of the map in, in the region, how far do you think Israel goes in Lebanon? Are we clear on what their goals are? Their goals aren't clear right now. And I mean, frankly, that's because they're keeping their class close to their chest. We've seen in the past um, in 82 and 2006, um, you know, they have a track record of, of being unsuccessful in meeting their aims. What we're expecting to see for the, uh, the firm and what we've been telling our clients is um, sort of... Uh, probably holding of territory along the border uh, to allow them to to have incursions further into Lebanon to to try and um, continue to suppress some of that Hezbollah activity along the southern border up to the Litani. There was, of course, the um, announcement by the IDF yesterday encouraging uh, Lebanese citizens to move um, further north towards 
uh, towards Beirut, only 20 kilometers from Beirut. I think that implies that the IDF is, is preparing for a number of different scenarios, but um, which of those they choose, um, including um, how far they go into Lebanon and what kind of presence mm -hmm. they choose to have, I think is going to depend on a couple of different factors, including uh, domestic pressure at home. Okay, Neve McBurney, Associate Director for MENA at Control Risks, with some very valuable context around what continues to unfold in the Middle East and the implications. Neve, thank you. Coming up, as Germany faces growth headwinds, we will speak to the founder and chairman of the Berlin Global Dialogue and a long-time chief economic advisor to former German Chancellor Angela Merkel. That exclusive interview with Lars Hendrik Roller is next. Plus, later, I'm going to speak exclusively to Oliver Beta, the CEO of PINCO owner Allianz. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, the German government has promised a growth package to boost the economy in 2025. Jörg Kukis, chief economic advisor to German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, spoke to Bloomberg from Berlin about the need to lift the country's growth rate. It's uh, definitely too low. Um, we are um, struggling uh, to get positive growth this year. Um, but the more fundamental problem is that we don't only have a cyclical growth issue, we also have a structural growth issue. OK, well, let's stay on this topic. Very pleased to say I'm joined now for an exclusive interview with Lars Henrik Roller, founder and chairman of the Berlin Global Dialogue, which is taking place here, of course, in the German capital. He also served as chief economic advisor to former German Chancellor Angela Merkel, so someone who's very well positioned to talk about this German economy. Lars, thank you for joining us bright and early on set on a big day for you and the team at the Berlin Global Dialogue, of course. And we heard from one of your former colleagues, you were the predecessor, so you know him well, talking about the views around the German economy. The German economy is struggling. This isn't just an issue for Germany. This is an issue for Europe, for global growth. The German government itself essentially sees no growth this year. What is going on with the German economy and what is your outlook as we push in to 2025? Well, the German economy has some challenges. A part of it is actually homegrown and part of it goes back for many, many years. The other one, of course, is the geopolitical situation and the fragmentation and the trade issues, which are, you know, disadvantaged for, for Germany. I think Mr. Cookies is right that the problem is the potential growth rate in Germany, which is relatively declining, and it's basically because of the labor market. We don't have enough people in the job, and I think German government is working on that. Second big issue is capital investment in Germany, and the finance ministry and the, the chancellor are working on improving conditions to get more private investment into the German economy. And I think then, uh, if we get through that, and this government has about a year left mm -hmm. before we have elections, I think then the potential growth rate and the future for Germany will look better. OK, so the specifics around capital market investment and the labour market, and you think we will see changes on that front. What does that do to the growth pitch of 2025? They're working on that, uh, and I think they still need to push through some of these changes. I think the growth rate for 25 looks much better. Um, certainly we will have growth again in 25. A lot of it also depends on Europe. You mentioned the Draghi report, or we mentioned the Draghi report and other things. I think there's also the technology issue, sort of how do we actually treat investment in the technology area and the bureaucracy and the regulatory issues associated with technology. And that's the third area the German government is also very concerned. But most of those competencies are actually in Brussels. Mm. The auto sector, clearly a key driver of that's the right. German economy and now Huge. facing a pronounced <clears throat> challenge. VW considering closing factories for the first time in, in decades. To what extent is the challenge of the auto sector of Germany a failure of the Schultz government? I don't think it's a failure of the Schultz government. Um, I think it's basically a development where technology is changing and companies have to adjust to new technologies. And I think they're doing it. Uh, I think they're going through a transformation. So the positive side of it, they will be able to do that. I think Volkswagen, also Ola Kelenius, who's today at the Berlin Global Dialogue, talking about trade tariffs with China. An interesting question for the German economy. Yeah. I think that is something which uh, they will work on. And I'm quite positive that we will get there. 
But they're going through a difficult period at that time. But I'm hopeful again, as I said. To what, what, what do you think the show. chances are that we avoid those tariffs? The discussions are ongoing between know. Brussels and yes, China. Yes, we have about a month left. And uh, I was never a big fan of anti-dumping uh, procedures. I think the good thing about these anti-dumping procedures is that they bring people to the table. And if the Chinese are willing now to talk about their subsidies, which is a big fundamental issue for us, the industrial policy discussion we've been having, also at the Berlin Global Dialogue, and we get a solution in November, then it's well done. If we actually get into a trade war or you know, have these tariffs in place, then that's a failure of the system. So the point is, you know, Brussels um, and the Chinese, I think they need to work very hard to prevent that from happening by November. How vulnerable is Europe to additional tariffs from the US as we look ahead to look, the elections in November? Look, this is not a new story. We've had a previous Trump administration also imposing tariffs on Europe, not only on Europe, by the way, in steel and aluminum. And they were also threatening at the time to impose actually tariffs on our auto sector, which we actually ended up not, uh, not having. So I think that is a big issue. And I would suspect, depending on who wins, actually will not matter all that much, but somewhat, that there will be some additional tariffs. Mm. Um, and we will survive that. I don't think it's going to be the end of the European economy. I think it's not helpful. And generally, if it escalates, particularly with the Chinese, is going to be a very bad thing for all of us. Uh, but I think the main problem for Europe is what we were discussing previously, to getting the potential growth rate up uh, and solving our problems at home. Uh, I think then Europe will have a, a bright future. And clearly, if the stimulus in China kicks in, that That's could right. be helpful to the German economy as well. Is the German economy still over-reliant on China? Um, for imports and exports? I think the relationship with China, which is a major trading partner, has been beneficial for both sides. So I don't think that... We've learned lessons from Russia, though, haven't we? That is true. So we need to be mindful of not being too dependent. But as long as you do trade, and as long as uh, German economy or European economy is benefiting and we're creating jobs in Europe, I think having trade relationships is important. What we need to do is, is avoid dependency in critical areas, particularly supply chain areas. And I think there we need to be smarter. That's the lesson learned. Uh, but I do believe that China will be a strong economy, obviously, even though they have some domestic issues, as, as you probably discussed. Uh, but, I, but I think we need to be careful of not going too far with this. I call it the independence trap. Actually, I said that mm -hmm. yesterday at the Berlin Global Dialogue, of not going too far in the other direction, because in the end, we will all lose. So we need to find the sweet spot of getting uh, not too much dependency, but also work with countries like okay. China. Looking for that sweet spot on yes, global right. trade. Lars Henrik Rolla, thank you very much indeed. The founder and chairman of the Berlin Global Dialogue, joining me exclusively and a former, of course, advisor to Angela Merkel, the former chancellor of Germany. Coming up, we are going to have more from the Berlin Global Dialogue. I'm going to speak with Oliver Betta, the CEO of PINCO owner Allianz. That exclusive conversation at 6 30 UK time. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back now to some other stories making the news. Nike shares have extended declines in after hours trading as the world's largest footwear company withdrew full year guidance. Nike is seeking to reset expectations before incoming CEO Elliot Hill takes the reins later this month. The company reported a 10% fall in fiscal first quarter revenue, just short of the average analyst estimate. But Nike's gross margin and sales in China exceeded expectations. Bloomberg has learned that Boeing is considering raising at least $10 billion by selling new stock. Sources say the plane maker is looking for ways to replenish cash reserves further, depleted by that ongoing strike. The share sale isn't seen as likely for at least a month as the plane maker struggles to assess the cost of the walkout by 33,000 workers. Later today, French President Emmanuel Macron will be speaking at a panel here at the Berlin Global Dialogue with Bloomberg's Head of Economics and Government, Stephanie Flanders. That's at 2.15 p.m. London time. Tune in for that. This is Bloomberg. Good 
Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I am Tom McKenzie in Berlin. These are the stories that set your agenda. Israel vows to retaliate after Iran fires about 200 ballistic missiles, saying Tehran made a big mistake. We bring you the latest from the region. Traders flock to haven assets with gold holding near a record and oil moving higher. But Chinese shares listed in Hong Kong extend their blistering rally for a 13th consecutive day. Plus, Tim Walls and J.D. Vance go head-to-head -head in the only vice presidential debate before the U.S. election. We bring you the highlights. Let's check in on these markets then. Currently, a European futures pointing to modest gains of around two-tenths of a percent after the losses that came through yesterday of around nine-tenths of a percent. FTSE 100 futures pointed to gains of 13 points. S&P futures stateside looking at losses of around three-tenths of a percent after the downside that came through for the S&P yesterday. Nasdaq futures also pointing to further losses, currently pointing lower by 71 points, down four-tenths of a percent. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. The geopolitical tensions, the focus on the Middle East, the risks of war in the region keeping investors on edge. And we have seen that move into those safe haven assets with gold holding above that 2,600 level, down five tenths of a percent, but still at those near record highs. Brent getting a lift again on the back of these tensions at 171 is the increase on Brent at $74.82 after jump Jumping almost 5% yesterday. Euro dollar at 110, a little softer by a tenth of percent. And the benchmark US 10 year yielding 372. Let's flip the board and check in on the Asia markets. You've seen a pronounced rally once again, particularly in the property stocks of China. So Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong jumping the most in almost two years. The Hang Seng China Enterprises Index climbing around 8% and extending, as we said, that win to about 13 consecutive days. The MSCI Asia Pacific currently up five tenths of a percent. And it's China and it's the gains coming through in Hong Kong that are overpowering the downside in Japan with the Nikkei down 2.3%. Let's get back to the Middle East right now, where Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has called Iran's missile attack on the country, quote, a big mistake. The Israeli army says many of the Approximate 200 ballistic missiles were intercepted, with one person reportedly killed in the West Bank. The attack was in retaliation for the killing of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah and Israel's move into Lebanon. The Revolutionary Guard and Iran's armed forces are ready both defensively and offensively to repeat this operation with multiplied intensity. Okay, Bloomberg Horizons Middle East and Africa anchor Jamana Pasechi joins me now for the latest. Jamana, what do we know about this attack, the motivations for Iran, and if Israel will respond? Yeah, uh, all valid questions. So around 7.30 p.m. local time, uh, Israel said that uh, Iran had fired up to 200 ballistic missiles towards the country. Explosions were heard around central Israel. Now, the military says that most of these missiles were intercepted, causing limited damage, though it appears as though shrapnel may have killed one person on the West Bank. Uh, Iranian state TV, however, said that its strikes had been targeting important security and military sites expected to be some of the sites whereby uh, the missiles that were launched to take out Hassan Nasrallah uh, initiated from. Now, this is, of course, the second direct strike from Iran into Israel. They have been vowing for weeks now to respond to the killing of Ismail Haniye, the uh, Hamas leader in Tehran, but then more recently, the killing of Hassan Nasrallah uh, that occurred last week in Beirut, and then also alongside Hassan Nasrallah, and that airstrike, one senior IRGC commander was killed as well. And so they had been hinting that some form of retaliation was going to be coming. It came yesterday in the form of these ballistic missiles. And important to note here that the the potency of the attack yesterday was slightly higher in terms of escalation than where it was back in April. It was much less telegraphed than uh, it was last time around. And this time around, they used stronger and faster <coughs> missiles, these ballistic missiles, that were still being, uh, capable of being intercepted by the U.S., by Israel, uh, in conjunction with the U.S., which also helped Israel intercept some of those missiles. Now, uh, Israel, 
are saying, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, you uh, were just re referring to some of the comments from Netanyahu, saying that uh, Iran has made a big mistake tonight and it will pay for it. And the question here is how far does Israel want to go with its response? Axios just coming out without some lines uh, a short while ago suggesting that the retaliation will be swift and it will be more potent than what we got back in April, suggesting possibly even uh, some oil infrastructure targets, assassinations, and even in a worst case scenario, some of those nuclear sites in Iran as well. Okay, Bloomberg's Jamana Pesachi joining us out of Dubai on the latest in terms of that escalation, significant escalation in the Middle East, with Brent trading up 1.7% so far in the session, WTI pushing above $71 as we await for that potential and expected Israeli response, of course. Now, traders switching focus are positioning for swifter interest rate cuts in Europe, as signs mount that the region's economy is in need of looser monetary policy. Joining me now for an exclusive conversation around monetary policy, the state of the business, the state of that global footprint is Allianz CEO Oliver Better. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. The company is doing very well. Your stock is up 27% year to date. You have that global footprint. You have the exposure to insurance, the asset management, PIMCO. We'll get to that. But on the monetary policy front, given the challenges of this German economy, France as well, is the ECB at risk of being behind the curve? Should they cut again in October? Uh, I don't want to give advice to the ECB. They have much smarter people. I hope they would listen, enough. Oliver. They would listen. Yeah, but I think they um, they've done a good job. I think Germany needs more than just an interest rate cut to get its back feedback on the ground. So um, I don't think it, that will do the trick of moving it faster, fast interest rates. And I think they have to be also a bit cautious. Yeah, we have had a lot of inflation in many many areas that has come down. Labor cost inflation is not yet coming down. So again, we need to look, look at it very carefully. I don't think they're behind the curve, if I may summarize. OK. And would you push back against calls for them to cut again this month, given your, your, your can, line on being I cautious? I would, not rec I would recommend be very careful, because we misread a lot of information about in, uh, inflation earlier. Let's be uh, very, very consistent and cautious now. People want consistency and clarity of messages, not daily instinct reactions. How concerned are you about the German economy right the, now? Um, long term, not short term. I'm worried about sentiment and motivation of people, which we all know foreign economies is super important. Right? The Germans have the particular German angst. So with what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening between the US and China, we're very cautious. But most importantly, people are not investing because they feel uh, we're not offering a proper outlook for the population, how we're solving some of our fundamental issues to remain competitive, right? We're asking our population to transform the economy into something that's sustainable with regards to climate change. We are asking them to fund the world and to fund Europe uh, to change their problems. We are asking them to absorb millions of migrants uh, in a pretty mismanaged way, at least in the past. So we're asking a lot of our people and they're very worried about their, their ability to absorb all of these changes. So we need to have a very good strategy for the people of how are we going to deal with all of these challenges. What gives you that long-term optimism and what gets Germany there? Uh, it's many things. We have an extremely educated workforce. They're highly motivated, they're highly skilled. You know, in our company, we have some of the best people, best mm -hmm. engineers in the world. And I see that everywhere in our clientele. Um, our companies are producing some of the best goods on the planet. And... Um, we have a very stable society so far, right? So people like to live in Germany, they like to contribute. So we need to go back to that, what was called made in Germany, have the best products, the most innovative products in the work. And by the way, get back to working harder. Okay, let's get to your business, <laughs> working harder. Your team are working hard. You've had that performance year to date. Talk to us about PIMCO. What are you seeing in terms of client activity? And what are you seeing in terms of flows? Are you seeing more inflows into, into, into PIMCO and yeah, we the report, AUM part of the business? Thank you for the question. And because we're very proud of our colleagues in mm. PIMCO, um, they had as of mid-year uh, almost 50 billion net inflows. And that has continued strongly in July and August. I cannot give you for many reasons the concrete numbers. But we're very, very happy of the, about the strong flows that are happening and uh, they will continue. We're also very happy as the, the firm is pivoting into other asset classes. And they're, you know, wherever I go here in Berlin, top policymakers say, well, how does PIMCO think? So that means they have the premier franchise and fixed income. And we're very happy with that. Okay, so the client inflows you expect to continue at yes. the kind of levels that we're seeing. What about? Well, I cannot. I'm not a forecaster. No. You know, but based on what we see today, we are very, very strong. Actually. 
I think we're, we're running at uh, above 50% of net flows into active fund management. That's amazing. And what are you seeing in terms of client activity? given the macroeconomic concerns, the geopolitical concerns? This is when people go to active in bonds, um, when they really don't know what's going to happen. They need strong advice on what to do and how to position the portfolios. There's lots of risks. We're going to talk about them. Many of these risks are not priced in the market. Everybody's worried about the war. Are people properly worried about dev levels of debt in the public households? When you look at spreads, they're not really looking at that. Even if you think about it, we have the highest level of debt since the Napoleon Wars, yeah, after COVID. And now France just announced, ah, we're not going to get to the rules back until 2028, maybe 2029. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I was a bond investor, I'd be very, very careful and I'd, I'd ask some people that know what they're doing. Do French, asset, do French assets look attractive at this point or is there still too much risk? I would not focus on an individual one, but if I look at general uh, pricing of uh, public debt, I'd be very cautious. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, is that uh, more like venture capital? And I says, yeah, it's certainly a risky asset. Okay, it's a risky asset. French assets are a risky asset now. That's the, bas the basket you have to put them in. In terms of some of these tensions, and you nod to them, and we look ahead to the US elections in November, the potential additional tariffs that could come through, are markets overly relaxed? Are they overlooking the potential additional risks around further trade tensions? So on the one hand, people talk about it uh, all the time. There's a lot of noise. If you look at what has been communicated be before various elections and what people have done, I've been really impressed by the Americans. I have to say, you know, I'm as anyway a huge fan, but there's a lot of noise in terms of people are very clever, mm. right? It's about the economy stupid every American president understands. I'm not so sure our government understands it that well. OK. <laughs> OK, so maybe some lessons that Germany could take uh, from U U US, US politicians. Uh, interesting. Let's, let's get back to the rate question. Y you've benefited clearly from higher reinvestment rates. Is, is, there, is there retention? Do you see that continuing as, as the ECB moves to lower rates? Or is that a potential drag on the business and profitability in the, in the quarters ahead? No, there, there is no matter. Because we have had a, a tripling of net interest aid, uh, rate earns. Again, we are a believer that spreads on government debt, which we have to hold a lot of, have to widen. There can be the attempt again to use monetary policy to suppress that. But given the levels of debt, I think investors are not stupid anymore that they will allow themselves to not get risk-adjusted returns, at least that's what I'm mm. hoping for. And by the way, crowding out private capital um, out of the bond markets has turned out to be a very bad idea because we've been misallocating capital into public budgets rather than private investment. And given what we have to do in terms of transforming the economy, um, we need proper return on bonds. So what's, what's your longer term view then on neutral or, or where the neutral rate will be? The, the, I am um, again, ask Dan Iverson, you get a yeah. much better answer than from <laughs> Oliver Bete. Yeah, he will certainly yeah. have a much more informed view. Um, my fundamental question is where will be the real interest rate? And there will be a lot of pressure uh, mm -hmm. on that. So again, investors have to be vigilant. Yeah, making yeah. sure they get the proper return. Certainly on behalf of our savers, we're going to be very vigilant. Okay. Second, we believe that the policy makers have understood we need to invest in real assets. So regulation will have to change in order to mobilize the trillions we have in our balance sheet to fund the transformation. So it's about time we do that. Capital Markets Day in December, if yes. I'm not wrong. You're going to be outlining some new targets. Give us a sense, a flavor of what you may be nodding to. to and are you expecting to, to step up in terms of additional deal activity next year? Uh, nothing changing on M&A. We've always said, you know, if we find something useful that fits the budget and our criteria will continue to do it. By the way, we've done it for nine years now yeah. and no, no surprise. There will be asked when you're going to do the big deal. I haven't seen any in nine years that I would have done one or we as a team would have done. Second, we'll tell the investors in December. What it is going to be about is the following. We've now built the strongest brand in our history by a far cry. You take any criteria. There's JP Morgan, American Express and uh, Alliance and very little else. And that drives enormous amounts of clients to us. So we need to transform these opportunities into growing the customer base more strongly. That's the only hint I'll give you. OK, thank you for that hint, Oliver, <laughs> as we look forward to that Capital Markets Day in December for Allianz. Oliver Beta, really appreciate your time this morning. The CEO, of course, of Allianz, still seeing uh, pretty decent inflows uh, in terms of the PINCO part of the business, of course, in terms of asset management and a view there in terms of the needs around these capital markets. Oliver, thank you. Later today, Pleasure. French President Emmanuel Macron will be speaking at a panel here at the Berlin Global Dialogue with Bloomberg's Head of Economics and Government, Stephanie Flanders. That's at 215 
p.m. London time. So certainly tune in for that conversation as well. Coming up, Tim Wolves and J.D. Vance go head to head in the only vice presidential debate before the U.S. election. So was there a knockout blow? We'll be live in New York next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Tim Walls and J.D. Vance have gone head to head in what is likely to be the only vice presidential debate before the U.S. election in five weeks time. There was a, a shaky start for Tim Walls as he stumbled early on, but there were no knockout blows, sparring points, including immigration and whether Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. This issue of continuing to bring this up, of not dealing with it, of blaming migrants for everything. On housing, we could talk a little bit about Wall Street speculators buying up housing and making them less affordable, but it becomes a blame. Look, this bill also gives the money necessary to adjudicate. I agree, it should not take seven years for an asylum claim to be done. This bill gets it done in 90 days. Then you start to make a difference in this and you start to adhere to what we know, American principles. Donald Trump's inability to say. He is still saying he didn't lose the election. I would just ask that. Did he lose the 2020 election? Tim, I'm focused on the future. Did Kamala Harris censor Americans from speaking their mind in the wake of the 2020 COVID situation? That is, a damning, to... that is a damning non-answer. Okay, let's bring in Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn, who joins us from New York and was watching all of this for us. Vonnie, who won? <laughs> Well, Tom, it's interesting because it reflects the mood of the country right now. CBS did a poll right after the debate and asked debate watchers who won that very same question. And it turns out that they were basically tied. Vance had 42 percent support from those who watched. Waltz had 41 percent and 17 percent of those who watched said it was a tie. That's what we're seeing around the country at the moment. And that's why this final 34 day stretch is going to be so significant for the candidates. True, Kamala Harris has the advantage at the moment when it comes to fundraising. She out fundraised the Trump campaign four to one in August. We still haven't got September numbers. But in terms of everything else, even with the gap narrowing, it's going to be an extraordinary close race. And that moment that you saw there, that was probably the most combative that we saw the two candidates in the debate. It was a really genuinely almost convivial debate. Very few points of combat and almost traditional in that sense. Vonnie, any memorable moments then from, as you describe, a very closely run VP debate? Well, the answers were as we anticipated, and we'll get to maybe a couple of policy nuances that are perhaps new post this debate. But essentially, the questions that we were asking going into this debate were, did Kamala Harris and Donald Trump pick the right running mate? Could they get through this debate without making a huge gaffe? And would we learn anything new? And essentially, you know, it may have been proven that both candidates did in fact pick the right running mate because there were no massive gaffes. Now, there were a couple of small gaffes, maybe personal gaffes that have been owned since then. So at one point on a question related to gun control, Tim Walz actually said that he had become friendly with school shooters. He was actually talking about Sandy Hook victims and he had been in a room with uh, families of those victims and it's very likely that that's what he meant to say. But that has blown up on social media and Trump retweeted it and so on. And then there was an, another moment in which there were phrases like knucklehead being used, for example, by Tim Walz. And so those were some of the memorable moments from this debate but essentially it went off pretty much as planned and it you know they abided by the rule if you're the VP candidate do no harm. Okay Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn in New York on that vice presidential debate thank you for bringing us the top lines on that story. Coming up French Prime Minister Michel Barnier buys time to fix the country's finances delaying a plan to bring the deficit in line with EU rules. More details from his first consequential policy speech. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. To France now, where Prime Minister Michel Barnier has delayed a target to meet the European Union's budget deficit limit by two years. The real sword of Damocles is our colossal financial debt, 3,228 billion euros. And if we were not careful, it will put our country on the edge of a cliff. OK, for more on this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Caroline Gonat, who joins me from Paris with the latest. Caroline, what were your main takeaways then from Barnier's speech? Austerity is coming to France, even though that's not exactly what the French were hoping for during the snap elections. And there was a lot of booing and shouting from the opposition during the speech in Parliament yesterday. At some point, it was even hard to actually hear uh, the prime minister, because, as you know, uh, more than half of the parliament actually question his uh, legitimacy. As you mentioned, he's uh, decided to delay the goal of bringing the deficit back to 3% to 2029, which is two years after the end of Macron's mandate. So quite ironic there. That means kind of talking to the next administration. Of course, he wants to reduce the debt burden. The interest on the debt, for example, uh, is estimated at around 50 billion euros a year. That is more than the entire French budget for uh, education. So to do that, of course, uh, there's going to be some spending cuts. Uh, he wants local authorities to tighten their belts. He also is embarking on a crusade against social fraud, those who are cheating on the French welfare state. But of course, there is also the end of Macron's mantra for the past seven years, which is uh, raising taxes. Uh, Macron has consistently uh, uh, talk, been talking about bringing taxes uh, down. Now he wants to raise taxes. We didn't get too much details. We'll get those details in the budget next week. The top earners are going to be targeted. The uh, multinationals, those worth more than 8 billion euros, in order to raise at least 15 billion euros a year of uh, additional uh, taxes. At the moment, the left has not uh, put in a vote of no confidence. We'll see if there is one over the next few days. OK, Bloomberg's Caroline Gona in Paris on that speech by the new prime minister. Austerity in all but name coming for France, it seems. And a reminder that later today, French President Emmanuel Macron will speak at a panel here at the Berlin Global Dialogue with Bloomberg's Head of Economics and Governance, Stephanie Flanders. That's at 2.15pm London time. The opening trade is next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>